Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Scott Linden here. Glad you could join me. Uh, We are in the meat of the hunting season, and I hope you're getting out fairly frequently while fulfilling your familial obligations as well. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, Still grateful for everything that happens to me out in the field. You know, somebody years ago said something like, well, nobody got hurt on that hunt, and that's enough. That's how you define success sometimes. We'll define it in other ways here on the Upland Nation podcast this week as we go hunting with pro guide Terry Petro into the grouse hunting woods. Uh, Among other things, the guy knows his dog food as well, a representative for Purina. And um, we're talking to him from an interesting location. Let's keep it a secret for a moment or two. Terry will also cover things like how to keep your dog working to the front strategic feeding advice, one of, one of the things to look for in a dog food, and then even adopting a started dog. All those things from Terry, as well as a lot from you. We'll be talking about the things that you suggest that we not forget on our next hunting trip. You have some great suggestions. And we'll take a road trip to the southeastern United States for some late season birds if you need a fix and you got to get out of the snow i've got some uh, starting points if nothing else the upland nation podcast is brought to you by sage and breaker gun care products pointer shotguns mid valley clays and shooting school true lock choke tubes midwayusa.com pro plan sport from purina and landtrust.com and high viz shooting systems We had a most interesting hunt uh, recently, um, still chasing chuckers until the um, snow hits the high country there, and uh, went to a place I'd never been before. So thank you, Mark, for inviting me along on uh, what turned out to be a kind of a pretty serious chucker camp in the middle of freaking nowhere, down in a deep canyon, uh, no cell phone service, no power of any sort. We were self-contained in many, many ways which made it even more cool. Met some great folks, hadn't met before, all only there, only there because of our joint affinity for chuckers. One of the things I learned was uh, stealth, yet again. Yeah, even with chuckers. They're one of the notorious uh, covey birds that has a sentinel or two placed so that they can see everything everywhere. And uh, I learned that the hard way. Flick was working so hard, giving me some great points, some incredible finds. By the time I get up to where he is, which is the biggest mistake, somebody spots me and those birds are headed down the hill. Yeah, so um, here's what I'm learning, especially about chuckers, because they always do fly downhill unless they're pressed. So from now on, when I see Flick on point, I am going the other way. Using the terrain to hide myself from that sentinel bird, coming down the hill, and then moving in from below the birds, if at all possible. That's a lot of work. You know, some of those points he was hitting were 200, 250 yards away from me. And then the birds could sometimes be 20, 30, 40, 50 yards away from him. So you got to do kind of some geometry, but... It's a lesson that I learned the hard way. Now you don't have to. How about you? What kind of lessons are you learning out there? I asked you on uh, social media a while back, uh, what did you forget or what do you want to be careful about not forgetting? And I I was fascinated by some of your answers. And uh, Bruce Wondrak, yes, I've taken your lesson to heart. Trailer winterizing stuff. Yeah, on a night-to-night basis, sometimes when you're out there, you got to be careful about that. You know, whether it's just pouring uh, RV uh, antifreeze down the P-traps or into the holding tanks. Uh, beyond that, yeah, you can go hog wild on what you do to winterize. Wendy Bachman says uh, rain gear, yeah. Michael Salamone, he likes those lightweight collapsible bowls. Again, some of my chucker hunting friends were using those. I'm The jury's still out for me. I like being able to just carry the squirt bottles. Everybody can drink out of those. 
Electronic ear protection, <clears throat> yes indeed, uh, getting fitted for my new ear protection and um, looking forward to having those so I can use them in the field as well. Uh, Maddie Elise says, always carry a gun sling. You don't have to always have it on the gun, but it could be essential in a bind. Yeah, we were out there in the middle of freaking nowhere. We were probably 30 miles in on a, a in one of those side-by-sides. And here comes some guy walking down the ridge. We came around the corner. There was his four-wheeler. So he didn't walk the whole way in, but he's coming down that ridge, and he's got his shotgun in a sling, and he's got a walking stick. You know, he's older than most of us, still out there doing it. More power to you, mister. But that gun sling came in handy for him, and maybe it'll come in handy for you, especially if you need both hands, as Maddie says. Um, Mark Opulencia says, uh, a skunk kit and gloves. Yeah, perfect. Patrick Gilly, charge the collars and controller. I'm lucky enough now, and I'll be reporting on it soon. I have one of those uh, power packs, power, portable power packs. Yeah, you can run uh, 110 off it. You can run, um, you know, you can charge just about anything in any manner. So uh, I'm using that a lot. Carlos Lopez uh, likes to have a veterinarian grade crazy glue. Sometimes uh, so do I. Steve Zirkel. <laughs> Steve, you're showing your age. Advil and Gatorade. Yep. Lynn Glock, you might have the best one. If you if you really know where there is some of this, please send me the uh the URL for porcupine repellent. That kind of like bear spray, you put it all over yourself and the bears will stay out. No, wait, that's not how it works. No. Anyway. Thanks for all your tips, suggestions. Yeah, I made notes. I will be packing a couple more of those things, and maybe everybody else will too. That's what it's all about here on the Upland Nation podcast, helping each other. Now, anybody have any shooting advice? We're brought to you in part by TrueLockChokes.com. Uh, they uh, just finished a big sale, but there's still lots of great offers there. So go to truelockchokes.com, T-R-U-L-O-C-K, chokes.com, and figure out if uh, if you need to fix your shooting in one way or another, this is one way to do it. Get a better choke tube system, more dense patterns, more accuracy, better ballistics, you know, and, uh, of course, a lifetime guarantee satisfaction guarantee so lots of incentives plus all the things you want in a choke tube reliability great engineering incredible materials learn more at truelockchokes.com and uh, Purina Pro Plan Sport dog food is uh, well just got a new shipment thank you Carl by the way for that um ProPlansport.com. Learn more about their formulations. Uh, once again, I was reminded of how important it is to keep your dog's joints functioning well. And one way to do that is diet, nutrition. ProPlansport has the right proportions of glucosamine and omega-3 fatty acid. Poor Flick had to ride in the, you know, the hard diamond-plated dog box on the back of a four by four for a while and came out with sore elbows luckily they weren't sore for long and he was functioning as always at maximum capability soon after he got out and stretched his legs uh, learn more about all the ingredients in all the formulations at proplansport.com As I said off mic, I'm embarrassed we haven't done this before, and I'm so glad we could finally do it, and from a cool place, too. From Purina, among other things, Terry Petro joins me. Terry, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Well, thanks, Scott, for having me there. I appreciate the, the opportunity to uh, maybe answer a few of your questions and give you some ideas. And 
Well, you're a wealth of you're a wealth of knowledge, incredible experience, and and we're just going to jump around and cover things that are that are of, of interest to everybody. The first one is, where are you and what are you doing? Well, I uh, I work part time in my old retirement nest and uh, uh, being a representative for Nestle Purina Pro Plan Dog Food, and I am in Demopolis, Alabama, as we speak. <laughs> sitting in a little shady oak grove uh, off the beaten path and uh, at uh, VDD Group North America Arm Brewster Hunt Test. And VDD, uh, Verein Deutsch Drahtar. So for some of us, it's our German wire hair. Um, yeah, Verein Deutsch Drahars, and translated is the German wire hair. So, and, and the big, so, uh, this is the big test, am I right? Well, this is what what is considered the HZP test. This is a middle breeding test, but they turn that into a little bit of a competitive atmosphere in that they keep track of, of who got the most points. It's still an evaluation against the standard, uh, but they, they look at who got the most points and they award prizes to the top placements Hmm. And uh, and the winner gets this big arm brewster trophy and stuff. It doesn't make any difference as far as uh, the breeding goes, but but um, you know these these uh, these guys do do like their competition, so they want to win this this arm brewster award. Yeah, that's the American and, uh, way, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but it's still it's still a, a test against the standard, uh, you know. Much the same as Dov does the test against the standard, and uh, Kurtzart Club has the same uh, program going. Uh, the Drahar Club uh, has has their breed standard. They also incorporate uh, a breed show where they've got a 48 point evaluation of the dog's conformation from coat and structure, and and whether it's got a Roman nose or a German nose or uh, all sorts of different things that they evaluate, and uh, you have to have certain minimum scores on the evalu- confirmation evaluation in order to be able to breed the dog as well as performance and temperament and and uh, physical x-rays and blood tests and everything else. So Wow. So it's that middle breeding test that's going on, but they turn that into their showcase event, and they have uh, banquets and and presentations and fundraising auctions and stuff uh, in conjunction with the test. So it's sort of their big event of the year. You're getting me all excited. I'm going to be speaking at the uh, at the Epignol Breton version of that in December over in Oklahoma. So I'm I'm getting psyched now. Thanks. Um, you're watching some of this as well. Describe some of the aspects or components of the test itself that that uh, that these dogs are undergoing. Well, they've got um, uh, they got the group broken into two parts, and half of the dogs are doing the field aspect today, and will do the water aspect and the breed show aspect tomorrow, and vice versa for the other half. And the field aspect of the test, uh, basically, they've got dogs and they take them for a short run, and and uh, look at the at the run of the dog and whether it's out searching and what kind of range and how useful the pattern is and stuff. And they fire a couple gunshots with it, so they evaluate whether there's any sensitivity to the gun, as well as the the field uh, movement, I guess you would call it. Sure. And then, then another part of the field is they'll put birds out and bring the dog up on the bird and evaluate the pointing and the nose. Uh, you know, how, how easily the dog was able to locate the bird and, and uh, pointing at uh, uh, this HEP biddle uh, breeding test, they like to be able to have the dog point long enough for the handler to get up and flush the bird. Uh, whereas in the younger one, they just have to point a little bit, and, and then they can take the bird out without really much of a penalty. But in this one here, they really want the dog steady enough to allow the handler to produce the bird. And then uh, then as the, also part of the field portion of it is, uh, some, is two drag tracks, one on a duck and one on a rabbit. And uh, those drag tracks are 300, 400-meter 
acres long. So they're substantial long drag tracks. And there they're evaluating mostly the cooperation of the desire to go and get that that dead game and bring it back to hand. And they're they're also judged on presentation when they return with the game. That the dogs are supposed to present the bird the bird or the or the rabbit to the handler rather than do a drive by and drop it, you know, as uh handler reaches out it's supposed to be a nice gentlemanly presentation and, and i would yeah. presume unlike my dog they want the whole thing back not just the pieces that are left because he couldn't swallow them if if they have that problem that, <laughs> um, that's going to be that's going to be harsh on the scoring on the dog <laughs> if, if we have some some uh some cooperation issues where the dog decides it's going to eat the animal rather than bring it back yeah, let's not go there. I remember a rainy day in central Washington, and I hope I'll I'll forget it at some point in my dotage. But at this point, it was the low point in my testing career. Um, that's all right, then, Manny. Uh, you're all right. You're a good boy. <laughs> yeah. And then, then the other group is, is doing the confirmation evaluation and, and also uh, doing a search behind the duck where we, they release a... Uh, wing clipped live duck and uh, and in the BDD world they have it set up so that there is a duck track across the water a scent trail across the water that the dog is going to easily encounter and then they're evaluating whether whether this dog could, can track that dog duck across the water in an efficient manner and produce the duck and bring it back yeah. and uh so that's a little different than the NAVDA where it's more an independent duck search and the duck is a little superfluous. Um, and then the, then the next or the last part of the evaluation is a blind retrieve where they have a dead duck 30 yards or so. And I'm not 100% sure about these numbers. I'm not a BDD judge or an official, but but uh, I think it's like 30 yards away, and then the handler sends the dog to do the blind retrieve, and the dog should go across the water and find the duck and bring it back. And uh, keep in mind that these, this is the middle breeding test of plus or minus of two-year-old dogs. So it's not the four- or five-year-old veteran well-trained dog. It's, it's uh, you just did a puppy test in the spring, and now you're doing a, uh, pretty mature, uh, serious train test in the fall. So there's a lot that goes into these dogs uh, during the summer, you know, force fetching and, and steadiness and a number of other things that the handler has to do in just one summer. Yeah, and, and you use the term a couple times, and I think it's really important to mention these aren't just uh, tests to show off your dog as much as they are test to evaluate the dog's uh, uh, future as a breeding dog, too. Is that, am I on that right? A major emphasis on this is, is this dog worthy of a, a, good, uh, a good example of the VDD, of the Drahar Club's um, breeding program, and should this dog be bred? Yeah. You know, so, so if the dog has some serious flaws in it, they don't want to breed that. You know, and that's one thing I really love about the draughts is there's a lot of work that goes into determining whether these should be bred or not. Um, you know, you can, you can uh, if you're looking for a dog that fits the drahar standard, you can blindly mail order a drahar and have a pretty high chance of success at that puppy growing up to be a drahar and performing and acting and looking like a drahar. Uh, yeah. Some of the other breeds that don't do that kind of diligence, uh, you know, it's there's a lot of luck in what your your dog's going to look like um, between being a puppy and growing up to be a full size honey dog. In in this this testing program, it, it it's it's intense. I mean, I, my current dog and my last two dogs could have been registered VDD, and I chose not to because I just couldn't make the commitment to the testing program, but. It, it is definitely something people would, certain people ought to do, and we should be grateful that some people do because they do hold up those 
breed standards to a high level? I tell people that when I bought a draught, I did it because I was lazy. I didn't want to do all the work that I would have to to investigate all these other breeds. I can just buy a draught, and somebody else did all of the hard work in producing a dog that fits and meets that standard that I'm looking for. I love so, it. So this is these are serious people, serious dog people, and they love their dogs. Are you one of those serious dog people? I uh, yeah. What kind of breeds are you hunting with these days? Well, I, like I tuned to, I've got two drawhars, and then they look at me a little cross-eyed in this group because I also have a, a four-year-old English pointer. And, uh, you know, they're wondering, why do you got an English pointer? And I said, well, that's a long story for over a beer or something. So, <laughs> uh, but I got two drops and an English pointer. Well, I don't have a beer I can offer you right now, but I want that story. So tell me, what, how does, how does uh, the Petro household become a United Nations of canines? Well, my wife, if she had her choice, I think she'd have five dogs. <laughs> I'm the one that limits. Wait a minute. Uh, 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 please re- repeat that again so I can tell my wife the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid my wife's going to listen to this, and, and uh, she's going to be looking for another one. Oh my uh, God! But, you know, she she'd like to have five dogs at, at least. The last time we talked about it. But, wow. But um, three is three is enough. They're all house dogs. Uh, I joke a little bit about it. They're during the day they're house dogs, spoiled rotten house dogs, and at night they're kennel dogs. So I can get a good night's sleep at night. They're not wanting to get out or they're not barking about something or other. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so they go out in the kennel at night and they sleep on the couch during the day. But, uh, and, you, uh, you know, d- you didn't mail order your English pointer, though, did you? No, that was, uh, I, I, my older draught had uh, pulled an Achilles tendon and uh, down in Kansas quail hunting three four years ago, and, uh, and it was questionable whether she'd ever be able to hunt again or not. There's not a lot they can do when they, when they tear ligaments in the, in the muscle above the Achilles, and, uh, so I wasn't sure. I guide for Pine Ridge Grouse Camp in the fall, and I, I had my my draught Nellie up at Pine Ridge, uh, getting her certified to Dan Woodcock. And I was talking to Jerry Havel at Pine Ridge Grouse Camp that breed English pointers, uh, the Hampshire Elgu pointers, and uh, he didn't have any any older puppies or anything like that that was going to help me out and everything. But he said, "Well, I have this dog in the kennel." And uh, it turned out he had a two-year-old English pointer female in the kennel that, that he just hadn't had time to be able to do a lot of work with her. And, and he said, take her home, see what you think of her. If you like her, keep her. If you don't like her, bring her back. And, and uh, it was about 30 minutes when I got her home that she was sound asleep on my wife's lap on the couch. And, and uh, she's been part of the family ever since. And, that That is a good sign. I love that. You know, uh, a lot of... A lot of times people will ask me, uh, you know, should I get a puppy? Should I get a started dog? Should I uh, get a dog uh, out of a rescue organization? You, in, you know, in, in one way, uh, rescued that dog. You adopted that dog that was, uh, you know, an adult, essentially. What was the, what kind of advice would you have for somebody who's considering, uh, you know, bringing a more mature dog into their household, whether it's training or even introducing to other dogs? Well, don't ever tell Jerry Havel that I rescued a dog from his kennel. <laughs> because I got to I got to live with him all of October and then uh and a few other times in the year. But yeah. but um yeah, you know, a, a used dog, I I consider anything over about 8 weeks old a used dog. They yeah. have they have the opportunity to learn things that you don't necessarily want them to learn that doesn't fit into your lifestyle and your kennel and and also now you've got some bad habits that you got to break as well as, as uh, you know, obedience training and, and field training that you've got to do. And uh, some of those bad habits are pretty hard to break. Uh, Lucy's got a couple that she just didn't have an opportunity. She has a tendency to come from behind quite a bit, and, and I don't really care for that, but that's sort of minor on the – deal of bad habits otherwise she was a pretty clean dog jerry took care of her well uh you know but um that's just something that you got to think about when you buy a buy a 
an adult dog or an older dog is is uh, their way of training been being trained may not be the same as what you're expecting and wanting out of a dog that you're training and yeah, uh, yeah. so there's things that you might have to fix um, yeah you know buying a started dog isn't a bad thing if you buy it from a good reputable trainer and and she you know she's got uh, you know, some good training and obedience work been done with her, but uh, if it's just a dog that that's been sort of ignored and and uh, you know there may be some some issues. You know, this dog was a kennel dog, so so she wasn't housebroke, and we found that out about 15 minutes after she had gotten <laughs> up on my wife's lap, and, and but. But as soon as we let her know that that wasn't appropriate, uh, like within a day or two, she was dead solid, bro. Well. You know, house broke dog. You know, she learned quick. Oh, well, good. And, <laughs> and she really, she really likes sitting on somebody's lap on the couch. So. Well, there you go. You know, you're a smart enough trainer to figure out that if that's what gets, if that, if that is what floats her boat, use it to your yep. advantage. Oh yeah. You know, uh, by the way, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast, everybody. That's Terry Petro over there, and I'm Scott Linden, the host. We'll talk grouse hunting as well down the road on this discussion. But before we do, I want to get back to the the what you mentioned as your pointers, uh, maybe one of her less admirable behaviors. And I got the same thing with my wire hair here, and that is you say come from behind. Uh, explain that to me and, and then then help me work on that problem a little with flick well whether you whether you're in the field or in the woods it's always nice to have the dog working forward of you yeah because if if she goes beyond um, deeper bell range or you can't see her then at least you've got a 180 degree direction to look for the dog rather than 360 degrees. It could be in any direction behind or in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so it's always good to, when you're working a young dog and just getting that search pattern habit uh, ingrained in the dog, you want the dog always working towards the front. Um, and uh, what Lucy does is, is uh, she will go out you know, take off from me out front, and then she'll curve right or left and start searching, and she has a tendency to make that whole big loop. And by then, I've walked past her, and she's coming in from behind. And if she were to point a bird while she's back behind me, um, now, if nothing else, you know, if I'm hunting with somebody else, now I have to delay the progress of going forward to go work the, the bird that she's pointing behind us 40 yards or something like that <laughs> and uh, not too bad but the other day up at pine ridge when i was guiding it was also just just started raining pretty seriously and we were trying to get back to the truck in a popple cut and uh and lucy i think she pointed for woodcock on the way back and they were almost always behind us so instead of getting to the truck where it was dry we had to spend more time going back and, and shoot at and miss a woodcock because she was pointing behind us. It would have been at least nice if she was pointing in front of us so we could keep keep working closer to the truck every time. I, I so, guess that that's a good problem to have in in one way, <laughs> but I know what you mean. I'm constantly surprised at how quickly my dog Flick will, uh, without me knowing it, get way back there and then zoom past me you know, at a one foot distance as he's heading back in front of me. Can you, do you, you have any advice for us on how to keep a dog out front? I mean, is it too late for Lucy and too late for flick, but somebody who's got a young dog, maybe they can do something. Well, you know, sometimes uh, some people use a long check cord out in an open hay field or something just to keep the dog going forward. But, um, I use more my motion and, and, uh, uh, yelping at the dog or yodeling or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. giving her a little direction. You know, if she goes off to the right and heading off to the right, then I'll give her a call and I'll start walking to the left. So she comes across in front of me. If she gets behind me, well, then I I, I basically stop and I get the dog, you know, call the dog and get her moving towards the front of me all the time. And what you're trying to do is, is 
generate that habit of the dog being in front of you is good and behind you is not good. Uh, you know, that's that's essentially what I do. I don't get yeah. real bent out of shape about it, but when they're young, when they're, you know, 8, 10, 12-week-old puppies and you're just out running a little bit in the hay field, you can, you can generate that habit pretty easily. If yeah. You wait yeah. Until six months of age before you start doing it. Now that bad habit might be ingrained into the dog, and you got to start breaking that bad habit, which is going to take a lot more effort, and uh, it'll be a lot more difficult than if you hadn't allowed that uh, to come about in the first place. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. You might know Phil Swain. Phil's a NAVDA judge, uh, been for a million years. I think his member number is three, but. Um, he, uh, he, it's, it's somewhere around 80. There you go. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're what? Mine is 49, and my name comes in the alphabet before. <laughs> <laughs> so you know Phil. Phil he's, pointed out to he's, me. He's a dear friend of mine. Yeah, he's so he's a great guy, well. despite his breed choice. But that's another story. Phil pointed out to me at a test. I was gunning at a test once, and he said, you know what? One way to get your dogs out front is they, they're looking for the brightness of your face. And you've described basically the same thing without using the word face that you stop you head the other way the dog can't see your face they're going to come around till they can see your face and i found that a very useful technique as well yep yep well yeah, you know and, and it really gets critical you know sometimes we're walking into a place or out of the out of a place on a trail and uh and the dog if he's hunting in front of you is always working the you know the sides of the trails you know mm-hmm. 10, 20 30 yards either, either side of the trail in the woods in front of you so you see what's going on and as soon as they're around behind you not only do you have to stop and wait for them to catch up but you don't know what's going on back there and uh you know so you just you just keep on you know when you know they they get the good dog when you're they're in front and they get to get up here you know get the, yeah you know you start uh you know, corrected them to, to come around when they're behind, and pretty soon they just figure it out. Yeah, and you know, it's funny. I still use that when he comes when he streaks past me after being behind me, he gets praise. When he gets back in front of me, he gets a little bit of praise, and it works. And I'll yeah. tell you, here's what uh, you've just described a bunch of reasons for it. We were out, you know, a week ago Saturday in the afternoon in one of my favorite quail spots. And I was turned around. We were moving into the wind a little bit. I turned around looking for the dang dog in the tall gra- t- tall uh, bushes. And what comes over our head from what's now behind us? A mega covey of valley quail. Yep. Because we were looking the wrong way at the wrong time. So, you know, let that be a lesson to me. Opportunity lost. Yeah. Oh, and we'll have lots more from Terry Petro. Uh, more advice in any number of areas in which he has experienced. Probably answer some of your questions along the way. And then if you're looking for a nice, warm place to go later in the season, we'll cover that as well. Brought to you in part by Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School. You know, if you... <laughs> I used to think it was just fly anglers, but it's shotgunners too. If you're missing more than you're hitting or more than you care to to miss maybe it's time for a new shotgun mid valley clays and shooting school is sub gauge central they've always got 20s 28s and 410s in stock an incredible selection i've been there in the gun room uh there's something for you there and you can find stuff that you can't find anywhere else the joy of midvalleyclays.com is You can shop for any number of guns, and then you can talk to Dave Fiedler about a specific gun that you're looking for. He's got a line on stuff that you might not find anywhere else. Check it all out at midvalleyclays.com. And clean it with sageandbreaker.com, gun cleaning and care products uh, from from, uh, gun cleaning mats to bore cleaners of various sorts in fact a new bore cleaning system coming out soon scoped gun cases coming out soon if you are one of those who are heading to the mecca of Mern's quail sonoida 
Arizona, stop by, visit the new retail shop there. Get on the mailing list for future sales and new products. Now's the time because jingle bells are just about here. Sign up at sageandbreaker.com. And we're back at the Upland Nation podcast. Scott Linden here. That's Terry Petro. Demopolis, Alabama. Never heard of it. That's not easy to get to either. Oh, I bet. <laughs> and you're probably a master at travel. <laughs> uh, I'm not a master. I'm still at the whim of Delta. But uh, I had to fly to Atlanta and Atlanta to Birmingham and then two-hour rental car drive uh, uh, southwest of Birmingham. You know, and, and I tried to find a bigger city to fly into the with one plane. And, and New Orleans is four hours, and Atlanta is four hours, and uh, and uh, Mobile, Al- Mobile, Al- Alabama, down on the coast is only two hours, but they only fly direct in the winter time, and this isn't quite winter yet. So, <laughs> so it's just a hard place to get to. It's sort of. Uh, I guess you would call it Southwest Central Alabama or something. I'm not sure. Whatever. I'm I, I'm I'm imagining. I've been in that country, done a couple shows down there. Uh, love that place. Uh, would love to get back, especially in the winter time. But let's let's switch gears here and talk a little bit about uh, kind of what what was your day job for so long, and and that is being a, a you know a, a tried and true expert on. Uh, nutrition and conditioning hunting dogs. If you had any advice for us, just broad, general in that category, uh, that maybe you see popping up time and time again when you talk to people, what 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 would you suggest? Well, well, first of all, I, I, my day job before I retired wasn't wasn't Perina. I didn't get into Perina until my last day of. Re- of uh, early retirement offer ah. at, a, at a previous company. I was electrical engineer and engineering manager for most of my life, and I just did the dogs on the side. You know, that was my hobby. Yeah. And, uh, and the engineering manager position was my my uh, enabler to enable me to play with dogs. Uh, but the last day before I took an early retirement offer, Southwest from Perina which I knew through Navda and judging with him for years, uh, calls me up and, and recruits me. And I didn't even know I was looking for a job, but I've been doing <laughs> that for, for almost 15 years now. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, Farina in the meantime, has done a lot of, a lot of training and stuff. And I've had dogs all my life and I've been, I didn't have to jump ship from a different brand to start working for Farina. I always been feeding even, uh, even when I was in, in in grade school, we were feeding the family collie, uh, Green Bag Farina. Wow. Um, so your question uh, on on nutrition and 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 picking a dog food, uh, the thing I want to stay away from is is you're going to be feeding this dog the same food for long term, and and you'd like to know that this food is going to be good for your dog for the long term. And uh, the first thing I would ask is, is uh, what's the track record of the dog food? Have they done any feeding studies, or at least have they been selling the same food for a long time, so it's going to cause problems that would be well known by now? Um, that would be my first question. Uh, then the quality control of that dog food, do they do a lot of recalls, or do they have problems with it, or, or is it pretty pretty solid formulation and production and they got a good quality control system to to ensure that uh, that the food isn't isn't varying a lot and some batches are are bad for the dog and some are great for the dog uh, you know so so i want to i want to have a reputable firm that i'm buying the dog food from yeah uh, yeah i don't, don't want to have to do that research myself and I don't like the idea of them doing the research on my dog. You know, my dog feeding their food is their research program. Yeah, uh, real so. good point. I mean, you think about that, and there are a million brands out there, and, and that's that's a real good starting point. Uh, do you feed before a hunt? 
generally not. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a once a day feeder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of opinions out there and everybody's entitled to their opinion. But, but my understanding from the, the scientists and the veterinaries that, that we have on staff at Farina is, is, um, when you feed a dog, it, um, that, that digestive process uses energy and creates heat. Yeah. And, and it's, it's something eight to 12 hours from when you feed the dog before that digestive process has gone through and that energy from the food is available in the blunt stream for the dog to work. Got it. So when you feed in the morning, that digestion, you know, first of all, the dog's carrying that full load of food that he just ate. Yeah. The digestive process is using energy I'd rather my dog was using for hunting. It's creating heat, and heat's not a good thing when you're hunting unless it's 20 below zero, and, and that's a different kind of heat anyways. And that, that energy isn't getting into the dog's bloodstream until that afternoon or evening. And, uh, and none of that really makes a lot of sense. So if you feed in the evening after the, you know, this is an hour or two after the dogs are done hunting for the day. You know, basically when I get home from, from the hunt or back to my trailer from guiding at Pine Ridge or something like that, I feed the dog at four, five o'clock, six o'clock in the afternoon. And, uh, 12 hours later, uh, six in the morning, that dog's um, bloodstream has received all the energy from that, or is receiving the energy from that feeding. Uh, dog evacuates the colon and, and gets rid of that load, and uh, and there isn't any more digestive uh, process creating heat and using energy. The dog's ready to go, and uh, and it can be most efficient with an empty gut and a bloodstream full of energy. Well, let's take it. Uh, that let, just makes the most sense to me. I, I agree. And let's, let's take it from there. So the dog is out, he's emptied, and you're ready to go on a grouse hunt. Uh, you're a, a, a pro guide. What are the things that, uh, th- that you would expect of, uh, of your dog out there? What, what kind of distance is that dog covering? Um, uh, all the other characteristics of a great grouse dog. Well, I've got, I've got three dogs, so so um, I don't really like hunting more than one dog at a time. I don't see a more really a substantial amount more birds found by two dogs than one. Mm-hmm. Um, and that way, I've always got a fresh dog uh, when we hunt one cover. Most of my hunters um, aren't really, uh, no offense or anything, but aren't in the shape to do a full day nonstop hunt. They like the the two hours and back to the truck and and move to another spot and go out for two hours and back to the truck and move to another spot and have lunch and do that over again in the afternoon. And uh, by running a dog uh, a couple hours at a time, you never really get a tired dog. You got a dog that at least isn't chomping at the bit to get out, but, um, you know, still, still working pretty hard when you get back to the truck. And you got fresh dogs in the truck, you know. So, so you're you're always hunting with a fresh dog. Um, if I only had one dog, it would probably be in a lot better shape than my than any one of my three because it's going to be down on the ground all day long. But that's really hard to to do on a on a hunting dog and repeat that, you know, for a few days in a row. Yeah. Uh, so, so I really like you know having at least two dogs that I can, I can trade them off, you know, I can hunt two hours in the morning with one, two hours late in the morning with the second one, take a lunch break and put the first one down again in the afternoon and finish up with the second dog again. And, uh, it seems like they're always fresh. Do you, um, do you work on range with a dog like that in the woods? Is there any particular style you like? Um, range is sort of a natural thing. You can pull it back. You can pull a dog back, but what you're going to end up doing a lot is, uh, you're going to be tapping on the collar. You're going to be calling a dog in. You're going to, you know, basically you're de- disrupting the dog's search pattern. Yeah. And now he's paying a lot of attention to trying to stay within your comfortable range. Um, 
I'm really surprised. I've got uh, my old Drot is is uh, is a pretty good running dog. She's out in the grouse woods, 50 to 70 yards. Mm-hmm. My younger Drot is a big running dog of the three, and she'll be, you know, she'll hit 100 yards at a times, but a lot of it is spent at 40 and 50 yards, so it's still fairly comfortable. Yeah, and yeah. the pointer is actually surprisingly the most working dog of the bunch, and she's running more times than not in that 30 to 50 yard range yeah that is and, kind of surprising I, yeah well I, I think that's the the grouse dog breeding and the l heel breeding is is a closer more cooperative dog and and i really like to let the dogs determine what they're comfortable with and it, it comes down to when they go on point on a bird um what the birds are doing can you get to the dog on time and and uh, sometimes the the hunters that i that i have with aren't going to go 100 yards into the into the woods yeah uh, yeah to find a dog on point so then you gotta then you gotta sort of work them back and keep them a little closer and and uh, i try to minimize that because it, it is disruptive to the dog's natural um search pattern at all now they're now they're worried about about you know paying attention to you and and staying in range rather than looking for birds so, yeah yeah i don't think they do their job as well if you got to bug them a lot uh, that, that is uh, a great observation uh, i love that idea you know we all want to uh, we're all hacking our dogs for one reason or another at some point uh when it goes beyond training and it's out there in the field i never thought about it being distracting to the dog that is excellent um you know, and, and the the real neat thing, you know, in the last uh, uh, probably a decade or better now, is these GPS collars. Mm-hmm. Uh, There's such a relief to know exactly where that dog is. Um, you know, it used to be if the dog was born 40, 50 yards away, you couldn't hear the bell, and you figure he was a runoff, and, and who knows where he's at. And now you find out that he's just 80 yards over standing on point. <laughs> waiting for you to show up, you know, and that oh, yeah. collar will will tell you that, and it's just a comfort. If you got a bigger running dog, and the dog, uh, you know, haven't heard it for, for a yeah. few minutes, and you find the dog's really just 100 yards over there, still working for you, but just beyond what you can hear. I love it. You know, so that's a, that's a real helpful thing. What? Uh, that technology really helped. Well, help us with help us with something non technological, and that is our grouse hunting in general. You see the best and the worst out there, uh, good examples and bad examples of everything. But do you have any suggestions, uh, whether it's strategy or tactics or something even more practical than that? If we're grouse hunters, uh, and most of this would apply to anybody hunting almost anything, w- what are some of the things that you want to make sure that your clients do? Uh, that maybe they they don't do naturally. Um, well, first of all, um, the concept of well, yeah, the, okay. Let me let me go this route first. The the concept of you don't always have to be walking and moving to be hunting. Mm-hmm. If if you're in a nice open area and you got a nice aspen cut, you're along an edge and you see this dog working through and it looks like it's doing a nice job and you're sort of in a small opening that you can maybe swing a gun and, and shoot if something happens, um, stop and watch the dog once in a while. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody's always marching down a trail or marching through the woods and and i like to slow down and let the dog work to cover more thoroughly and and just watch the dog you're hunting even though you're not moving your feet you're you're watching this dog go through the woods and uh just you know just slow down and enjoy the enjoy the show i guess you could you could say um you know sometimes uh, hunters are pretty much uh, contained on a trail or something or you know i i'm the old guy at pine ridge so i get the other old guys and sometimes we're working trails and and uh the last thing you want to do is get two guys break your guns over your shoulder and they're talking to each other and walking at four miles per hour down the trail yeah and no idea what's going on until a bird jumps out and flies right in front of them and they're surprised um 
you know, I, I like them to slow down and uh, and watch the dog and be prepared as, if a grouse does come out. If you stop once in a while, just like pheasant hunting, sometimes that unnerves a bird, and, and you are the one that, that caused that bird to flush along a trail, and you get an opportunity. Um, and, and I also see if you're walking down a trail too fast, now the dog that we just talked a little while ago about wanting to keep that dog out front, He's got to spend most of the time on the trail, running on the trail to keep in front of you because if he goes into the woods too long, you walk on by him and he comes out behind and then I yell at him and he's got to run up front and, you know, so he spends most of his time trying to stay ahead of us rather than hunting again. And, uh, and I try and try and enable the dog to do, dog knows where the birds are better than we do and he's going to find them better than we will. So I want to give that dog all the opportunity I can to let him do his job. Yeah, it's our uh, motoring down a trail without paying attention to him isn't really doing him justice. You know, he might might see something otherwise if you slow down and just watch the show. I I can't agree more. You know, it's funny every year in my survey I ask people why they go hunting, and the number one response with a bullet is to watch the dogs work. And yet, what do we do? We clomp forward the whole time. Great advice. Words of wisdom from the woods. Terry Petro is my guest here on the Upland Nation podcast. Terry, we'll do this again sometime soon. I'm going to turn you back to the arm bruster, the big test for the middle, the the adolescent dogs in the VDD. Enjoy the rest of your visit down there. Thanks again, and I appreciate your being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Have a great day. Okay, you too, Scott. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And I am having a great time at uh, landtrust.com, laying more plans for later in the season and uh, even fishing season after that. Landtrust.com is kind of, I'm describing it as the Airbnb of, uh, of public, public access, if you will. Private ground, well managed by farmers and ranchers and similar folks, forest land managers and that sort of thing, that is now available to us guys on a daily basis. Exclusive private land takes the stress out of all your planning. You want to go to Montana? You want to go to Nebraska? Here's a spot. It's your spot. It's nobody else's spot for that day. Very affordable, starting about 120, 130 bucks a day. And um, you are assured of well-managed land that often is managed not only for cattle and crops, forest ground and water, but birds. Take a look at what they have to offer, about a million acres worth at LandTrust.com. Pick and choose, sign up with your free account and then scout for quality upland experiences for you and your dog. After all, that's why we go. Learn more at LandTrust.com. And if you want to see what you've been missing, boy, that ought to be tattooed on my left forearm, uh, then go to HighVizSites.com, H-I-V-I-Z Sites.com. A multitude of easily installed shotgun sights using their light pipe technology. You know, there's a reason they are original equipment on Benelli's and Browning's, Remington's, among others. The right sight, no matter what your shooting style, will help you. And so will the Learn tab at HighVizSites.com. Dozens of shotgunning tips just go to highvizsites.com and click on the Learn tab. Well, like me, perhaps you are chomping at the bit, sick and tired of shoveling snow, and if you want to go somewhere and get a last-ditch bird hunt in, here are some quail hunts that you might consider that, um, that will get you out of the cold and into the slightly less cold they're starting points. You'll have to do your own homework, but if you are near Florida or thinking of being down there anyhow, 
they've got a whole series of quail enhancement areas with a string of one-day hunts. You have to apply for some of those in January and February. So learn more about them. Florida quail enhancement areas. In Alabama, you'll probably play more golf this time, you know, the, the late in the season. But if you're looking for quail, one of the biologists I talked to suggests some of the waterfowling places. Uh, Blue Springs Waterfowl Management Area for starters. So take, take a look at those and uh, maybe your next road trip uh, will you'll also have to pack a shotgun and some ammo and, and don't forget the dog. And the road trip this week was brought to you by MidwayUSA.com. They have just about everything. If you missed their Cyber Week sale, don't worry. You can still get a significant discount. Sign up for their email or text messages, and you'll get 10% off your next order. Lots of last-minute or late-season gear for you. Like I've said, I will be hunting California later in the year, so I am stocking up on non-toxic upland ammo right now they've got the bismuth and the steel take a look at the suggestions they've also got a lot of smaller gauge ammo it's not the issue it used to be luckily for me because of midwayusa.com take a look see what they have to offer for your next hunting trip midwayusa.com and i'll be shooting some of those birds i hope well i'll be shooting at some of those birds with my pointer shotguns so happy with the side by sides and now they are available in so many colors if you're a fashion plate like me then maybe you ought to take a look at the green bronze and gray Cerakotes the shiny nickel silver the bluing case coloring and all come with a seven year warranty yeah the last thing you need is a gun that won't function when you're really far from home. If you got a youth and you're trying to put something under the tree, well, they've got some youth guns. They've also got a 28-gauge case colored over and under. So check it all out at pointershotguns.com. Find a local retailer and go pick one up. Ho, ho, ho. Sure appreciate your listening. Terry Petro, thanks for all of your insights. Always love talking with you, and I will see you at Pheasant Fest, if not between now and then. Thank you all for listening, especially if you left a rating or a review. Please tell one person about the Upland Nation podcast. That's how we grow. We're made possible by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Purina Pro Plan Sport Dog Food, Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, True Lock Choke Tubes, MidwayUSA.com, LandTrust.com. And you know, a lot of this information is in more detailed form, as well as a whole bunch of other suggestions for you. It's all at FindBirdHuntingSpots.com. Well, I hope your season continues to go well, and everybody comes home from every hunt safely. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks again for listening to the Upland Nation Podcast.